So before we start exploring all the different animal kingdoms, we're going to start talking about just characteristics that animals have, or different ways that we can classify animals. Now in this phylogenetic tree that you see, what you're actually looking at is all of the different animals or all of the different animal phyla, uh, as well as some characteristics that we see derived. So things like a pseudocelum or segmentation or deuterostomes. What we're going to talk about in this video and in the next video is essentially what do these terms mean? What is bilateral symmetry? What is meant by mesoderm? So we're going to explore those characteristics and I'll admit it's going to be kind of overwhelming at first because this is going to be a lot of new terminology that you haven't used before. However, when we talk about each of the phyla individually, we're going to revisit these words a lot. So after watching these next two videos, really practice with these terms. You're going to see them a lot more and we're going to start applying them a lot more to different organisms. So this first video on animal classification is going to explore digestion as well as symmetry. So let's start with digestion. In animals, we find two different, I guess you would call them strategies for digestion. The first one we'll talk about is incomplete digestion. And you can think of this as more primitive. And by primitive, what I just mean is this came first, and then we saw the other type of digestion kind of form. So incomplete digestion means that organisms only have one opening that serves as both the mouth and the anus. So this is where food comes in, and this is where waste products go out. As you might imagine, maybe not the most wonderful way to live. There's quite a few organisms that do this, and the example I have on here is a jellyfish. So again, a jellyfish, in this case, the jellyfish on the bottom side of the jelly has a mouth and anus, that's kind of what we refer to it as, is where again, food's gonna come in, it's gonna digest, digest in its stomach, and then those wastes are gonna be released in the same area. What we see later on in the development of animals is we go from incomplete digestion to complete digestion. And this is going to be something that you're more familiar with because humans are a great example of complete digestion. But I will say a lot of animals in the animal kingdom do have complete digestion. Incomplete digestion is a little bit, I don't know if rarer is quite the right word, but just more organisms have complete digestion. So with complete digestion, organisms have a separate mouth and anus. So food material is going to go in through one opening, and waste is going to go through a separate opening. What's kind of cool to think about, I don't know how familiar you are with human anatomy, but it's not just with humans, is that organisms that have complete digestion, essentially what's happening is there uh, is only one tube, right? It is a tube that connects your mouth and anus. So from your mouth, you're going to your stomach and to your uh, small intestine and your large intestine. It's just, it's just one long tube. There are other organs involved. It doesn't really matter in this course, uh, or in this course, we're just not gonna explore that much. But just keep that in mind, is that yes, we have two separate openings, but in a way they're still connected. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're still connected. And again, most organisms have complete digestion. Now, if you have complete digestion, so this is kind of a nice starred area. If you have complete digestion, we can further categorize the way your embryo develops. And what I mean by that is that when you are only a couple of cells, I should say when you're only a couple hundred cells, your digestive system actually starts forming very, very primitively. It starts getting, um, starts making essentially that tube. And with the embryonic development, the way we can classify organisms with complete digestion is which end of the digestive system forms first. It is, is it the mouth that forms first, or is it the anus that forms first? So the first organisms or, or kind of group of organisms we'll talk about are the protostomes. So proto means first, kind of like prototype. And then stome, uh, maybe you're familiar with stomata. 
Stome refers to kind of mouth-like. So protostomes literally translates to first mouth. So organisms that are protostomes, when you're looking at their complete digestive system, when you're only, again, only a couple hundred of cells, your embryo starts literally forming that tube. And you can see that here in this image. That tube starts forming. So organisms that are protostomes, what's happening is that tube starting to form and it's the mouth end that's forming. And then eventually it'll finish and uh, finish the anus second. Most of the animals that we're going to explore in this class are protostomes. This was the, I guess, first characteristic that shows up on our evolutionary tree. And then the other type of classification is deuterostomes. Here's that stomes again, meaning mouth. Deutero refers to second. So deuterostomes means second mouth, meaning the anus forms first. Uh, so you can say it either way, the mouth forms second or the anus forms first. So again, same thing, you're only a couple hundred cells, that embryo starts forming that digestive tract, and it's just the anus end that's formed first. There are less organisms that are deuterostomes. It does show up more recently in evolutionary history. Us, as humans, we're included. And again, you don't have to write the examples down now. As we explore the different animal phyla, we're going to reiterate this. I'll be like, hey, we're talking about sea stars and their deuterostomes. Uh, so just kind of for now, understand what a deuterostome is. Again, for both protostomes and deuterostomes, this only applies to organisms with complete digestion. This should make sense because if it was incomplete digestion, they have both a mouth and an anus, and it's the same opening. There's not one forming first because they're both the same thing. Now, thinking about benefits and drawbacks, scientists don't really think uh, slash know if there's any benefit to the mouth forming first or the anus forming first. It's just we saw this switch um, in evolutionary history, not really sure what triggered it, don't really see any kind of benefit. This isn't to say there isn't one. We just don't quite know about it yet. So this was all about digestion. Another way we can classify organisms is by the symmetry they have. And, and I mean this as simply as going back to grade school when things are, this is symmetrical. You have a half piece of paper and you cut half, etc. So there's actually three different types of symmetry, though I guess you could argue this first one, asymmetry, isn't really symmetry at all because asymmetry means not symmetrical. And the only animals in the animal kingdom that are asymmetrical are sponges. Some sponges are more symmetrical than others, uh, but there's no, I guess, rhyme or reason to it. And we'll explore that more in the next couple slides. Sponges just kind of grow. <laughs> um, they kind of just do their own thing, especially like this one here, like very asymmetrical. There's no pattern to it. And that's because sponges don't need a particular pattern. This is going to be more apparent when we're talking about sponges. But again, this is our only example in the animal kingdom that actually lacks any kind of symmetry. Now, the next group of organisms that evolved were ones that had radial symmetry. And when thinking about radial symmetry, I want you to first start thinking about lines of symmetry. And what I mean by a line of symmetry is that on an organism, if you draw a line, is it the same on both sides? Let's talk about humans first. It's going to be on the next slide, but let's talk about humans first, right? We have one line of symmetry that goes vertically down our body. You got that one line of symmetry. We're the same on the left and right. You can't cut us any other direction. There's no other lines of symmetry. We only have one. If you are a radial, radially symmetric organism, you have multiple lines of symmetry. So let me actually draw that on here for you, maybe make it a little bit more obvious in case you're struggling with this idea. So here on the C star, here's a line of symmetry. I drew a line, same on both sides. If I could draw straighter, <laughs> there is another line of symmetry and another line, and another line, and another line. This particular species of sea star has five lines of symmetry. It has more than one, which is what makes it radial. Jellyfish, they have like technically infinite. If you're looking, uh, actually you can look anywhere on the jellyfish, right? Here's this left and right. 
If I was looking straight down at the jellyfish, then it's a circle, which could be, you know, cut tons of different ways. If I am looking at it straight on, but then I shift a little bit. Okay, well, I could turn it that way and shift a little bit and do it this way. And sh So things that are more circular, like jellyfish, pretty much have an infinite number of lines of symmetry. End of the story, or point of the story, it's more than one. It's all it needs to be radial. Organisms that have radial symmetry, like this jellyfish and like this sea star, are typically arranged by top and bottom. So thinking about the sea star, there's a top side and a bottom side. The jellyfish, there's a top side and a bottom side. And we usually refer to this as the feeding side and the non-feeding side. Jellyfish are feeding at the bottom, not feeding on the top. Sea stars, feeding on the bottom, not feeding on the top. It could be vice versa. I can't think of an example, but it could be. Uh, just letting you know, that's kind of how we refer to these organisms. And the reason I mention that is because think about humans. I guess technically we have a top and a bottom, but we have a left and right. We have a forward and backwards. We have lots of different angles. Whereas with our radially symmetrical ones, they don't really have those other angles. They have a top and bottom and that's it. They don't really have other directions. And because of that, because they kind of internally, even externally, lack directions, they move slower, like literally move slower. For a sea star to move in any particular direction, it has to coordinate all of its body to go in a certain direction. But kind of an upside to that is, is they can move in every direction pretty easily. Uh, they can, you know, move this way and move that way and move this way and pretty much with the same ease. There's no clear, this is me moving forward. Like they can choose what direction to move in. They move just as great in any of those directions. Same with jellyfish. But because it's a lot of coordination, it's just going to be slower, right? We are not going to see jellyfish that swim as fast as humans, because it takes them a lot longer to coordinate their entire body to go in a particular direction. The other thing about radially symmetrical organisms is, although you're like, oh, well, if they move slower, they're more likely to get predated upon. Yes, but they can sense predators a lot easier. They can sense predators from every direction. Their sensory organs are not all concentrated in one area. They're on this side and this side and this side and this side. They're evenly throughout the entire body. There's no sneaking up on a starfish like it knows you're coming. Uh, there's no sneaking up on a jellyfish like it's sensing you. It can sense everywhere equally. So it's this idea of trade-offs. Yes, they move slower, but they're able to sense everywhere around them. Now let's talk about the next type of symmetry and the final type of symmetry, which is our bilateral symmetry. Humans are a great example. And I'm going to use humans a lot because I think it's going to help. So we'll talk about the cephalization thing in a moment, but I want to talk about that second bullet point. Directional streamline for movement. So as I mentioned before, with a sea star, they've got to do a whole lot of coordination to make sure that every single tentacle is going in the same direction. With humans and other bilateral organisms, we have a clear front and back. It doesn't matter what organism you're talking about. There is a clear front side and back side, a top and a down, a left and a right, because we have one line of symmetry and our whole body is planned like that. So you as a human, you are optimized to move forward. You can move backwards. You can move sideways but it's not graceful and it's not nearly as fast as moving forward. So yes, we're faster than a sea star, but it's because we're optimized for one direction and kind of suck at the other directions. The other thing about our uh, directionality is what happens is a lot of our sensory organs are also directional. So humans, you know, your ears, our eyes, our nose, our mouth, like all of our sensory organs on the front of our face. So if you wanted to sneak up on a human, you just come up from behind them and just be super quiet. With a sea star, they can sense everything around them. With humans and other bilateral organisms, we can sense the things in front of us really freaking good. Everywhere else, though, not too hot. 
Now, going back to that first bullet point allows for cephalization. So cephal, that root, refers to head. So allowing for cephalization, essentially what that means is because we're left and right oriented, because we have a clear directionality, our body plans can have a centralized area for sensory organs. And that's kind of what we use as the definition of head, like in the head is the sensory organs. By being bilateral, by having centralization, we can have this head area develop. But sea stars and jellyfish can't have heads because they don't have a direction. Uh, so it, this is kind of a complex idea. If it's easy, just remember it as like, ah, well, bilateral organisms have cephalization. But again, it's because of that directionality that allowed for this head region to kind of develop and evolve. Again, we've got benefits, right? We can move a lot faster, but only in one direction. Uh, and, and we only sense really in one direction. So again, everything that we just talked about are just ways in general we can further classify animals, different characteristics that we can look at when we're talking about our earthworms, when we're talking about our frogs or talking about our sea anemones. So practice these words, practice what they mean. You're going to see these a lot as we dive more into the animal kingdom.